Hello, and welcome to an HL only specific uh, notes topic. We're going to be looking at topic seven, specifically starting with topic 7.1. So topic seven is all about the really detailed mechanisms of DNA replication uh, and protein synthesis, going through transcription and transcription regulation and translation. So. Uh, a good amount of content on these notes are going to be supplemental or supporting the stuff that goes with the uh, SL content. So if there's some part of this that you really don't understand uh, and it's being maybe not general enough for you, you might need to go back and rewatch some of the things about the SL content that's related to it um, to help make more sense. Because this is really just the, the specific HL content that you need to add on to the SL content. Okay. So being that we're looking at the more advanced information or more detailed information about DNA and about how DNA is replicated, there's also going to just be a little bit of a hodgepodge of other information that's going to be thrown in there as well. So we will be talking about the structure of DNA uh, and how DNA is going to be replicated, but we'll also be talking about nucleosomes, talking about how DNA can be supercoiled in order to create chromosomes. We'll be talking about the, again, going back to re re visiting Rosalind Franklin's contribution to uh, Watson and Crick's study of DNA and how they determined what the actual structure of DNA was actually going to be. We'll be talking again about replication of DNA and all of the important enzymes like polymerase that are responsible for it. We'll be going through the mechanisms of DNA and some of the experiments that were done to determine um, the role of DNA in living things. Uh, we'll look at sections of DNA that are used for proteins versus ones that are used for non-proteins, leading into transcription regulation, which will come up in another set of notes. Uh, that's what else. Uh, all of these, really, we're going to be going through tandem repeats for DNA profiling. We'll be talking about the Hersey and Chase experiment. Uh, and, of course, we'll be oh, they're, um, really going through the, a lot of the details for um, just in general, what are all the complex enzymes that are used in order to go through DNA replication? Uh, so really, we're, we're going to be hitting all of the main points. The only one we're not really going to focus on is this one down here, um, skill four, uh, uh, um, skill two there, uh, visualizing or going through um, a molecular visualizer software. Uh, if you wish to do that, you, you can do that you know, on your own uh, using your own computer. I'm not going to run through that simulator in the video. So what we're actually going to start with first is Hershey and Chase. And Hershey and Chase did um, a very important experiment because before their experiment in the mid-20th century, it was actually really unclear about whether or not chromosomes um, or proteins were responsible for genetic material or basically which of them was the guide for how a cell was going to function. So if you remember, they did know about DNA, they knew about its structure in general, and they knew about the bases, and they knew that there were four bases. So there were four bases, and those sequences made up the, you know, the sequence of DNA, the, the order and the number of those bases. But if you look at proteins, proteins, they're made out of amino acids, and they're made out of 20 different amino acids, and they are also dependent on the sequence or the order of the amino acids for getting different types of proteins. So scientists would be looking at, you know, the complexity of living things and they would think, well, how can such complex living things be built from something as simple as a, a molecular molecule like DNA that is um, or a, mo a biological molecule uh, like DNA that only has four bases? Because it seems like that's a really simple code to have everything boil down to just being what is the order of these four specific building blocks for making you know an entire complex living organism with that well proteins because proteins are made out of 20 different amino acids there's a lot more variation that could exist with those 20 different amino acids and so they really weren't sure which of those were actually the thing being passed you know, from parent to offspring, and therefore was the store of genetic information uh, when we go through reproduction. So, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, they developed this fantastically simple and accurate way of determining whether or not that it was DNA or it was protein that is getting passed on through the process of replication or reproduction inside a living thing. And so what they used was a virus so we don't talk a great deal about viruses, but viruses are incredibly small, very, very small. Here in this image, 
that big green sphere, that is a bacterial cell. And then that the little um, orange sphere, little looking alien little creatures, those are a virus. And so viruses are even uh, minuscule compared to bacteria. And remember, bacteria are super small compared to our normal cells. Our, our cells are huge compared to them. So viruses are incredibly small. And so viruses, if you remember, are not really considered living things because they don't really reproduce on their own. They don't really have a metabolism. They're basically are just a collection of nucleic acid. Either they can be DNA or they can be RNA. Uh, it's surrounded by a protein coat, basically a barrier, a physical, a physical shell for them to just kind of you know, exist in while they're waiting till eventually they bump into another cell. And what happens when they bump into a cell is that the virus will then inject the genetic material, so inject the DNA or RNA into the cell, and then it will use that genetic material to kind of take over the cell. And it will reprogram the cell so that the cell, instead of doing its regular protein synthesis, it's going to start making copies of the viral DNA and it's going to start making copies of the protein coat and then assembling those copies inside of the cell. And as it makes more and more of these copies, eventually the cell destabilizes and bursts and dies. And when it breaks open, you know, thousands of copies, maybe even millions of copies of these viruses get released. Uh, and then they spread, you know, to go and reproduce and go through this whole process all over again. So that's one of the reasons why they're not considered living is because they really need a host cell in order to reproduce. They need all the material that, were, that was made by the host cell. They need the enzymes that were made by the host cell. They need the membrane that was made by the host cell in order to go through this reproductive process. So they're not really, really a living thing. And since they're very basic, they're really just comprised of a protein coat, which is called capsid, and uh, a DNA strain. So oh, there are ones that are based on RNA, but for this specific experiment, they use what we call T2 bacteriophages, all right, and they specifically only attack E. coli bacteria. And the T2 bacteriophages are ones that are only based on DNA and they only have a protein coat, a barrier around them to kind of just protect the DNA. So then what they wanted to do is determine which is the, the reason why the, the virus gets to reproduce. Is it the protein coat attaching to the bacteria that makes it able to go through the process of reproduction? Or is it because the DNA gets put inside of the bacteria that allows it to go through the process of reproduction? So what they did, it was actually fairly simple. They decided to do radioactive isotopes. And so we talk about radioactive isotopes getting used a lot in different experiments. And so it's important for you to, to kind of, you know, have a section of your notes where you comment on where radioactive or radio or, or heavy uh, atoms are used in experiments because that general concept is very important for lots of biological, biological experiments. And sometimes you can be asked to kind of explain in general how they get used in science. So a radioactive isotope is something that is an element that is uh, an isotope. So it's a different form of that element. And if they give off a little bit of radiation, normally we can detect it. We can you know, take photographs if, of things really easily if they're giving off a little bit of radiation, or we can use special scanners that can pick up that small amounts of radiation. And so what they did was that they used sulfur, uh, 35, which is a radioactive isotope for sulfur, and they use phosphorus 32, which is a radioactive isotope for phosphorus, and they use sulfur for the protein, and they used um, phosphorus for the DNA. And so you understand why they use those specific ones? So thinking about their biological structure, right? So sulfur-containing amino acids, right? Remember the disulfide bonds we learned about? So there's no sulfur present in DNA, but there is sulfur present in protein. So there wouldn't be any kind of like cross-contamination of our ions. If we see sulfur somewhere that's radioactive, it must be inside of a protein. It couldn't be present inside of a DNA. Uh, and DNA has phosphorus and other nucleic or sorry, and proteins and amino acids do not have phosphorus. So because phosphorus is unique to DNA, we can be sure that if we detect phosphorus, Right? Then we know that we'd be looking at some DNA molecule. So we use very specific elements because they are unique to those biological molecules. Okay? So then what they would do is they would grow bacteriophages um, in these, these uh, components right? so that they would have a radioactive protein coat and they would have a radioactive phosphorus DNA. And then they would expose the um, E. coli to these radio-labeled viruses. And they would allow these viruses to basically, you know, go through the process of reproduction and kill, you know, the bacterial cell and make more of themselves. 
and then eventually they would isolate them and they would boil these bacteria and then um, or they'd make a, a supernate would not boil sorry they would um, centrifuge the the solution down so that we get the solid material left over and basically the bacteria would form a pellet at the bottom so here if we had it in a test tube the bacteria would show up here at the bottom and so they were able to isolate the, de, uh, the bacterial cells that were uh, infected with these viruses, right? And they were able to remove any of the radioactive material that might have been on the outside of the virus because it's going to get pulled away through the process of this uh, centrifuging. So what do they do? They separate the bacterial cells that have probably been infected with the virus, and then they go and they detect. Well, what do we see here in the supernate? Right? What do we see around the bacteria, and what do we see actually inside of the bacteria? Use a different color. What's actually inside the bacteria? So they go through this process, and then they discover that the solution around the bacteria only contains the sulfur radioactive isotopes. So that means that all of the protein coats were stuck outside of the bacterial cells. But inside the bacterial cells is where they found the radioactive phosphorus. And so that means that the DNA of the virus must have been injected into the bacterial cells. So once they've isolated them and they let them go through the reproductive process, the viruses were still able to reproduce even though they were separated from the protein coats, the sulfur-containing protein coats. So this pits, the, these pieces of information indicates that when a virus reproduces, the protein stays on the outside of the bacterial cell and it doesn't go into the bacterial cell. The DNA must go inside of the bacterial cell. And if we separated the protein from the DNA, as long as the DNA is inside of the bacteria, the virus can still reproduce. And so this helps to identify and confirm that it must be the, the DNA that is the reason why viruses are able then to go through the process of reproduction. So it must be the DNA that has the information for making a virus. And so therefore the genetic information, the inheritable information that gets passed down from one living thing to the next living thing, must go through the form of DNA, not protein. All right, so then this simple kind of experiment actually would solve a really important problem. Uh, and so from there, we now can start build a better understanding of what DNA actually is and what we're ultimately going to be using it for. So now that we know that DNA is definitely the genetic store of information inside of a living thing, just to go back, we're going to kind of summarize again um, how Rotson and Quick and with the help of Ross and Franklin were able to determine the structure of DNA. So just to remind you uh, from the story from earlier in the SL content, Watson and Crick had two different competing models. They didn't know which one was the right one and they managed to get an image to support them uh, and help conclude their idea from Rosalind Franklin uh, who was working with x-ray chromatography, right? And so, or diffraction, not chromatography, x-ray diffraction. And so that's basically, she was crystallizing DNA and then she was shooting x-rays through the DNA. And then as the x-rays either get absorbed or uh, bounce, oh, sorry, not absorbed, they either pass through the crystal and cause a photograph paper to, to be photo, you know, to change color on the other side. Or if the x-rays were being reflected away, uh, she was basically able to take a picture of DNA. And so from the very first image of DNA, they were able to determine um, what the general structure of DNA should be, where the phosphate and sugars are all connected to each other, creating a very strong backbone. And then the bases must be located on the inside facing each other. And so this, and then, then there's a double helix shape. And so DNA kind of twists a little bit in order to be a little bit more stable by increasing the number of hydrogen bonds. So uh, now we're going to kind of go through the general process of the general ideas of what we know about DNA structure, again, to understand why it is so stable. So let's summarize what we already know. So you know the DNA is double-stranded, that the strands are made of strong backbones of phosphodiester bonds, right, strong hydrogen bonds between sugars and phosphates. And then in the middle, we have the hydrogen bonds between the bases. We have A's pairing with T's and C's pairing with G's through our complementary base pairing rules. We also know that we've increased stability by having DNA run in opposite directions, or what we call anti-parallel. So as we go through the process of DNA replication, you're actually gonna to see today that anti-parallel has some negatives. It actually makes DNA replication a lot more complicated um, because of it being anti-parallel. However, it does increase the stability of DNA when it does its double helix twist. It allows it to be able to form more hydrogen bonds in between those twisting sections, which make it more stable.
And so we have our anti-parallel, strong hydrogen bonds, our three primes and our five primes. Remember that the five prime is always our starting point and the three prime is the ending point because enzymes are only able to add that phosphodiester bond here between the three prime and the phosphate of the next nucleotide. So if we're going to build the DNA, we're going to have to go from three to five in that order. So we have our purines and our per pyrimidines. And if you remember the pyrimidines, remember we have C-U-T, because we have uracil as well. Pyramid was cut, right? And purines being uh, two-ringed uh, nitrogenous bases versus pyrimidines being a single ring. And if we look at the distance, we go from one nucleotide to the other nucleotide this way, we always get a nice consistent two nanometers. It's hard to write today. Two nanometers in width. And so DNA should always be two nanometers in width as long as the correct bases have been matched up. And there should also be the maximum number of hydrogen bonds as long as the bases is all matched up, which makes it pretty stable. Uh, so it's really good for storing information over long periods of time. So again, phospho sugar, phosphate sugar backbone this is very repetitive. Uh, hydrophilic, so you know the DNA is also very soluble. Even though it's quite large, it is soluble in water, so it's easy for it to exist around in the cytoplasm and inside the nucleus. And the nitrogen bases are very reactive, so in order to maybe keep them out of the way so they don't accidentally do a bunch of binding to things that we don't want them to be bound to, uh, it's good that they are kept towards the inside, and that also protects their their order, their sequence, right, by keeping the, the weaker part of the DNA facing towards the middle. Um, but then by linking them together with the hydrogen bonds, again, goes back to adding to that more stability of DNA. Great. So thinking about all this, DNA replication is a mechanism in which we are implied by uh, base pairing rules. And so there's a lot of evidence based on what they've learned from that image and the stability of DNA and how it best works out that base pairing must occur. So if we look at the X-ray diffraction, the X-ray uh, helix was so tightly packed and regular. And so for this to be so compact and very regular, we'd probably be needing purines and pyrimidines to be paired with each other, not vice versa. If, again, a pyrimidine was bound with a pyrimidine, well, then things would be too big. And that means a purine would have to bind with a purine, which means it would be too small. So for that consistent two nanometer width that we find, Right? It has to always be pyrimidine goes with a purine and a purine goes with a pyrimidine. That's the only way we get that consistent length with it. Uh, electrical charges of adenine and thymine are more compatible and which allows it to create more hydrogen bonds or two hydrogen bonds. Same thing with cytosine and guanine, they can create three hydrogen bonds. So it makes sense for A and T to bind and C and G to bind because that maximizes the number of hydrogen bonds present and we're trying to use DNA or DNA is intended to be used as some type of storage of information and so stability is important. You don't want that information accidentally changing over time uh, or over use. You want it to be as stable as possible. Possible. So this logical deduction says that due to base pairing rules, A is going to have to bind with T because we need a purine to go with a pyrimidine, and C is going to bind with G, again because the purine has to go with a pyrimidine, and because it maximizes our hydrogen bonds. And so from there, um, this logical deduction that came from uh, once we just established the structure as a double helix from that image, uh, where the idea of how sequencing and how formation of a new DNA strand through replication uh, is based around. And so from that, we started to look for specific enzymes that would be responsible for doing these chemical reactions now that we know what we think the chemical reaction should be. And then over decades of studying DNA replication, we now have a very, very clear picture of what is happening inside of your cells. And so now we're going to go through that process and it's going to be a lot of vocabulary. It's going to be fairly complex, but if you can draw it out in your notes and you can kind of go through it step by step, explaining each of the enzymes and each of the structures that are, are involved in it, you should probably be, you should be pretty good at understanding it and explaining it on a test. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Not, not yet. We're not talking about replication. First, before we talk about replication, let's just summarize again the idea of formation of chromosomes. And so just to remind you again, this is still material that's important. It's connected to DNA. We talked about chromosomes all the way back in topic one, so it was coming up again here. Remember that DNA in eukaryotes is most often going to be supercoiled. Um, or coiled, at least maybe not up to the supercoiled level, but coiled to the point where we create these nucleosomes to make it more compact. 
basically a nucleosome is where we take a histone protein, which is an octo octo octometer, which is, means an eight-piece protein, and we're going to wrap the DNA around these um, histones over and over again, kind of like thread being wrapped around a spool, and then we'll create a line of spools kind of connected to each other, and that would be considered a nucleosome. And so that's the more compact version of DNA. Uh, DNA that is going to be less used might get packed a little bit more, and some nucleosomes might start to wrap around themselves, creating a fiber or a solenoid. A solenoid. Here, oh, where's my highlighter? Solenoid. Ah, that's bad color. Sorry. Let's use yellow. Here we go. Solenoid. Sol solenoid, sorry. Um, and if it's going to be used a little bit more uh, commonly, uh, then it would be just staying in the nucleosome form. However, eventually when we get to the process of replication, we're going to can continue to wrap these fibers and supercoil coil these fibers and then supercoil these fibers to eventually creating the chromosome structure that we uh, would see during mitosis or meiosis. So again, we talk about wrapping these, uh, these DNA around our histones. This is what a histone would look like. And so we have a eight protein structure. So there's eight circular proteins that kind of make the spool. And then there's an H1 protein, there's a ninth protein, which is there to kind of help hold the DNA onto the octometer, uh, kind of by you know making like a clamp that holds them all on top of each other. Now, when we get to transcription regulation, uh, we're going to talk more about how nucleosomes and histones are involved in the process of either increasing or decreasing the amount of use by certain parts of the DNA. However, uh, just you know, keep an idea and keep remembering in your back of your head just kind of what a chromosome is, what a histone is, and we're going to talk more about it when we get to 7.2. Okay, uh, so the last thing here is why we have to keep it super coiled. Ah, sorry, I went too fast. So basically it's saying why we have to keep it super coiled is it's just there's too much DNA. There's way more DNA inside of a cell than a cell would really be able to hold. So the only way for the DNA to stay inside of the nucleus of the cell is to compact it. It has to be compact at all times unless one specific part is being used. So even when we go through the process of DNA replication, not all of the DNA is open and exposed. We open sections of the DNA at a time as we go through the replication process. Right? So it's an essential that we compact this genetic material, material that's not being used and is never going to be used by specific types of cells. Uh, we want to compact it as much as possible and just kind of get it out of the way. It makes more space for you know, the other parts of the DNA that we actually do want to use. Right? Uh, if we organize the DNA really nice and easy in compact sections, like the compact chrom chromosomes that we see during replication, it's a lot easier to go through the whole process of DNA replication. And then by compacting the DNA either more or less, making it harder or easier for enzymes to get to it, we actually regulate the expression of DNA, which is what we're going to talk about in 7.2. So if it's more compact, it's, it's less likely that an enzyme is going to be able to use it, so then we're going to stop that piece of DNA from being used. If we make it easier to open, then it's more likely that the, the enzymes will get access to it, which means it's more likely that it will get used to make a protein. And so going between those two extremes, uh, we we can easily regulate uh, which parts of the DNA are actually being used at different times. So uh, remember that if we permanently supercoil something to the point where it's no longer going to be used, it's referred to as heterochromatin. And if it's in an, an open form where it will get used for transcription or it's still going to get used in order to make proteins, it would be called uh, euchromatin. All right, so euchromatin versus heterochromatin, those vocabulary words back from topic one, they're, they're still important now. Okay, so that's just a quick summary of nucleosomes, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in 7.2. So now let's get into the DNA replication. Okay, so DNA replication in eukaryotes is what we're going to be talking about. First off, DNA replication in eukaryotes, because there's just so much DNA, right? There's 46 chromosomes, there's 3 billion base pairs. Uh, DNA replication does not start at one point and then just continue all the way to the end. DNA replication has to start at multiple points, or what we call replication bubbles. And so this is an example, that's a replication bubble, and that's a replication bubble, and that's a replication bubble. And so these bubbles are having replication occur in both directions. And so one's going this way, another one's going this way. Sorry, it's hard to draw. Another one's going that way. And eventually, the replication bubbles will meet. And when they eventually meet, then all of the parts between them will have all gone through the process of replication. So essentially what we're doing 
is it, oh sorry, it makes it more efficient. They will only really initiate replication on what we call origin points. Typically these are long sections of A's and T's. You have any idea why it would be long sections of A's and T's? Yeah, because A's and T's have a little have less hydrogen bonds, right? They only have two hydrogen bonds versus C's and G's. So if you have a long chain of A's and T's uh, next to each other, that section of DNA is actually a little bit easier to open and to separate because there's less hydrogen bonds present. So normally long sections of A's and T's would be our origin point. And so from those origin points, we have replication going in both directions using a um, series of complex enzymes. And so we're going to learn about all these different enzymes. But the first enzyme that's responsible for going through this process, the very first enzyme that's going to start to open up DNA, that is going to be our DNA helicase. So DNA helicase, helicase like a double helix, ACE as it's an enzyme, right? It is the enzyme that is responsible for unwinding DNA, for opening up the double helix so that we can actually get access to the information to go through the process of replication. So let's look at DNA, case, DNA helicase in a little bit uh, more clear. So here we have what we call our parent strands. So as we're going to make the new strands, right? Those are the, the copied strands. So the parent strands are the original ones that we're starting with. And so we want to open up the base pairs. We want to expose them so that we can base pair. So if this was, you know, an A here, we want to be able to put a T next to it. And if this is, you know, a C here, we want to be able to put a G next to it, right? So we have to use the base pairs for complementary base pairing to build the other half of the strand that is missing. So each parent strand is going to be like the guide in order to make the other half that's missing. In order to do that, we need to have DNA helicase go and break all of the hydrogen bonds in a section of the DNA. So it just kind of moves through kind of like a plow. I guess there's some way you can think about it, right? And so it's basically unwinding the DNA and it's breaking all the hydrogen bonds one at a time. And if you break a hydrogen bond individually, it's really not that hard. It doesn't take much energy or effort to break a hydrogen bond. So that's why DNA helicase is designed this way, to move through the DNA, opening it at a single hydrogen bond at a time, because it's very efficient and actually can work quite quickly. Um, now of course, moving along DNA, having movements, and you know, there's a little bit of energy required for it to go through this process of breaking a hydrogen bond, this is going to be an active process, so ATP is going to be involved in this. Uh, this should just go without saying, everything we're going to talk about is going to require ATP. All of DNA replication is going to be an active process that requires energy. And so DNA helicase comes in and starts separating our DNA strand into two individual parent strands. All right, so that's our first step. Next, we have to start building what we call the complementary strands. So the parent strands need the other half. And so the other half is the complementary strand because it's built on the complementary or complementary base pairing rules. In order to do that, the enzyme that's involved is DNA polymerase. So remember that DNA is a polymer. So ACE is for enzyme. So polymerase, it's making a polymer. Which polymer is it making? It's making DNA, right? That's why we call it DNA polymerase. Now, it's important that you remember that it is DNA polymerase, not just polymerase. Because later, when we talk about transcription, there will be RNA polymerase because it makes RNA. And so you have to make sure on the test you're very specific. Don't just say polymerase. Make sure you say the exact polymerase that we're looking at. Okay. Specifically, the one that we're looking at here is actually called DNA polymerase 3 because there's actually different three different types of DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase 3 is the main one that does most of the replication or most of the complementary base pairing. DNA polymerase 1, we'll talk about a little bit later, is going to be responsible for fixing some issues on the lagging strand or the strand that runs the opposite direction. Uh, and DNA, DNA polymerase 2, you don't really have to actually know about DNA polymerase 2, it's not part of the, the IB content, but it's kind of a proofreader. So you remember that DNA should be 2 nanometers wide, right? So DNA polymerase 2 will move along the finished uh, copy of DNA and it will just check to make sure that it's always 2 meters wide, 2 nanometers wide. Uh, if it finds a point where it's not 2 nanometers wide, that means the wrong base was probably put in there and it will try to fix it. It will try to fix any mistakes in your DNA that happen when we go through this replication process. But really we're just focusing on DNA polymerase 3 and DNA polymerase uh, 1. Okay, so there's DNA polymerase and it's building the complementary strands. Now remember, we have to have our DNA being built in opposite directions because their DNA is running anti-parallel. So we have one DNA polymerase that would be moving this direction, right? 
where we have another DNA polymerase that's moving in the opposite direction because of the three prime, five prime concept. So remember, we can only build the DNA going from five to three. So since it's anti-parallel, they're also going to be running in opposite directions. Okay, and what it's going to be doing is it's basically going to attach itself to the DNA strand, the parent strand, and it's going to look at the, the base that it's attached to, and then it's going to grab random free nucleotides. So nucleotides that are just kind of floating in the, uh, the cytoplasm and the area around the nucleus, in the nucleus, and they're going to grab the free nucleotides and it's going to check them. It's like, is it this one? No. Is it this one? No. Is it this one? Until they fit properly. And then it knows it has the right one, and then it's going to make a uh, the, um, phosphodiester bond. So it's going to bind the, uh, the nucleotide to any nucleotides that are already there, and then it's also going to base pair them using the hydrogen bonds. And it's basically sticking you know, that nucleotide on to the strand. And then it's going to repeat that over and over and over again as it moves down the DNA chain. So these, new, these free nucleotides, by the way, they have actually a special name, D deoxynucleosides triphosphates, or if you wanted to short that, it's lowercase d n t p's. And so that triphosphates, do you remember where we see triphosphates before? Right, that's an ATP, right? An ATP, the triphosphate, is the whole reason why there's energy present, right? If it's a diphosphate, there isn't really an energy anymore. The same thing happens here. The triphosphate part of the nucleoside, of the nucle uh, part, nucleotide is because it has its own energy. So these free floating nucleotides in the nucleus actually have their own source of energy. So when the DNA polymerase uh, uses or creates this, di is used to create this di um, diphosphate bond, it doesn't have to go find an ATP molecule. The ATP molecule has already been physically added to, to the individual nucleotides. So they already kind of come prepared with the energy needed in order to create the co uh, covalent bonds. Okay, and then of course, remember, the DNA polymerase is always going to be moving from the five prime to the three prime direction down the DNA, all right? So it's always gonna to have to be uh, building, sorry, it's gonna be building from the five prime to three prime direction. So it's always, as it's making a new strand, it's always going from five prime to three prime. And that's because it has to be making these phosphodiester bonds, and it can only make a phosphodiester bond between the three prime of the existing nucleotide and the phosphate of the next nucleotide. Okay, so that's our DNA polymerase, which is part two. DNA polymerase comes in and starts doing its job. Now, let's quickly review before we have to add in a new concept uh, before we really move on to um, talking about other complications in DNA replication. So, if we've got DNA here, right? And so we've got DNA and we've got our DNA helicase and it's moving through the DNA molecule, right? One direction. Uh, and it's you know, breaking those hydrogen bonds. And then we have DNA polymerase right here, DNA polymerase 3, and it's on the DNA molecule and it's adding, you know, it's using the base pairing rules to make the new uh, DNA strand, right, the complementary strand. We have our DNTPs just around so that they can be used by the DNA polymerase. But then there's something else we need to know about. We need to know about what we call an RNA primer. And so what we're actually seeing here as well is this upper part, right, we're going to call this the leading strand. And the reason why we call it the leading strand, and we'll talk more about the other strand in just a minute, the reason why it's called the leading strand is because the DNA polymerase, uh, the DNA polymerase here, is going the same direction as the helicase. All right, so it's, the helicase is kind of going, uh, leading the way, and DNA is uh, DNA polymerase is following it, right? It's going, moving in the same direction. And so the leading strand is really pretty simple. Basically, you just need DNA polymerase to attach to the DNA strand and then just move reading the DNA and adding the new complementary bases in order to build the complementary strand. And it will continue on until DNA, until helicase eventually stops and or it hits, you know, a replication bubble that's been going in the other direction and, uh, and then eventually falls off. So DNA polymerase can go for millions and millions of base pairs uh, in this direction without really ever having to take a break or needing to stop. All right, so that's the leading strand because it's all moving in the same direction. But the thing is, in order to get DNA polymerase to start, 
it actually has a kind of a catch-22. It needs a nucleotide present in order to do its job, because what it's doing is that it's base pairing and then making a phosphodiester bond. So how can it base pair and then make a phosphodiester bond for the first nucleotide when there's no other nucleotides around on the new strand to attach to? So that's why DNA polymerase is going to have to attach to DNA through what we call a primer. And those primers are made out of RNA, not made out of DNA. And the reason for this will be clear later when we see about how we can eventually repl replace these primers. We have to identify them as being RNA versus them being DNA so the enzymes know what, which ones they're supposed to be interacting with. So being RNA, um, RNA primers will base pair with a section of the DNA, and then they will act as like the starting point for DNA polymerase to kind of jump onto the DNA and start making the complementary base strand. Later, we can remove these primers depending on their location, and we can replace them with DNA, but that can actually be done in all locations, and we'll talk about that at the end of these notes. So RNA primers are going to be added uh, to the DNA by what we call RNA primase. All right, um, primase. And so primase will add the primers, which are about 10 RNA nucleotides long, and then that will give uh, DNA uh, plus sorry, DNA polymerase 3 the kind of starting point in order to do its job. So that's the leading strand, which actually is pretty easy. And if that was it, if that was all of DNA replication, uh, then you would think, oh, this isn't hard at all. But it's the other strand, the one down here, that we're going to have to talk about in a few slides. And it's way more complicated because of this whole anti-parallel structure. So even though anti-parallel does make DNA more stable, it does make DNA replication way more complicated. Remember, the whole reason why it's going to get complicated with this other strand, which is called the lagging strand, is because replication has to always be going in the 5 to 3 direction. Because if we're going to add nucleotides, we can only add nucleotides on the 3 prime, forming a phosphodiester bond with a phosphate that's located on the next to the 5 prime of the next nucleotide. So that means the 5 prime is always going to be the start of our new strand, and the 3 prime will always be the end of our new strand. Right? So since we're always moving the 5 prime to 3 prime direction in order to make our phosphodiester bonds, there's going to be complications because of the anti-parallel structure. That means the leading strand is moving in the same direction as helicase, so it's moving in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, constantly going as DNA unwinds in that forward direction. But the lagging strand, which is the other side, is, has to be done in the opposite direction. So it needs to wait for new parts of the DNA to be open, and then it replicates them in the opposite direction of helicase. So it actually goes away from helicase as it ends up you know, creating the other side of the strand. And in order to do this, there's a whole bunch of other enzymes that are going to be necessary in order to actually build one complete strand of DNA on the opposite side, or what we call the lagging strand. So just real quick, the leading strand. DNA polymerase just basically can jump on where the RNA primer is, and then using the rule of building from the 5 to 3, it's just going to move along the DNA strand, all right, building new DNA in the 5 to 3 direction, using the template in the 3 to 5 direction, so it's going the, you know, the opposite direction is what, how the template moves, but it's building a new strand in the 5 to 3 direction. So you could say that it builds DNA in 5 to 3, but it reads DNA in 3 to 5, right? It reads the sequence in the opposite direction that it's building, so because it can only build in a 5 to 3 direction. So that's how the leading strand functions. Now let's look at what happens to the lagging strand because of the anti-parallel structure. So our leading strand is doing its job, right? It's got DNA polymerase 3, right? Adding DNA nucleotides in that 3 to 5 prime direction. Leading strand is doing fine. Lagging strand, right? The other side, it's got, oh, it's got a little bit more complications, right? So the lagging strand is the strand where we're going from uh, the opposite direction of helicase. And since the opposite direction of helicase, basically the strand can only be done in sections. All right? And so basically what's going to happen is we create what we call an Okazaki fragment, or a section of DNA that is being replicated uh, you know, one at a time in each one of these sections, and then slowly these sections are going to be connected to each other in order to create one long chain of DNA, just like the leading strand. So the, la the lagging strand is done in fragments, and those fragments are called Okazaki fragments. So,
Just like on the leading strand, there's going to be RNA primase adding RNA primers, except it's going to have to add multiple primers depending on how many sections that are done. So here, right, this new section, there was a primer present, right? And then this new section, then we move this direction and a new section opens up. So then we add another primer. And then as we move further down, we'll have to add another primer. So we're going to continue to be adding those RNA primers as we move down through the, 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 the lagging strand. Right? So RNA primase is going to be responsible for adding these primers so that it can allow DNA polymerase to jump onto the lagging strand and do its job. So RNA polymerase 3 is still going to be responsible for making the complementary base strand on both the leading strand and the lagging strand. It's just on the lagging strand, it's going to have to do it in sections. Okay. When we get to the end of a section, all right, so there used to be a primer here, right, an RNA primer, and we don't want RNA inside of our DNA, we want to have DNA. So we need to get rid of that RNA, and that's what DNA polymerase's job is going to be. So DNA polymerase job, sorry, DNA polymerase number one. So DNA polymerase one's job is that it's going to come along and it's going to replace the primers with DNA. It's gonna get rid of all of them, okay? But the problem is, is that DNA polymerase can only add in the new nucleotides. It actually can't make the phosphodiester bonds. So it's not as good as DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 can put in the nucleotide and create the phosphodiester bond. DNA polymerase 1 can only put in the nucleotide with base pairing. It can't make the phosphodiester bond. And so what happens is you get something like this, where you have all the DNA, but there's not enough phosphodiester bonds to make them all one continued piece of DNA. So it's kind of still broken up into smaller sections. So to fix these sections, there's one more enzyme that has to be involved, and that's DNA ligase. The DNA ligase is actually really important. We're going to talk about DNA ligase a lot uh, when we get to bioengineering and uh, genetics in topic three. So DNA ligase is going to be responsible for fixing these backbones so that we have all the Okazaki fragments fused together to make one continuous DNA complementary strand. So DNA ligase can build those missing phosphodiester bonds between the new pieces of DNA nucleotides that have been put in uh, thanks to DNA polymerase 1. So you can see the, the lagging strand is way more complicated than the leading strand. First, a section of the DNA has to be open. Then RNA primers have to add an RNA, RNA primase has to add an RNA primer. DNA polymerase will go, DNA polymerase 3 will attach and replicate a section of the DNA until it hits a previous primer that was already there. Then it lets go. DNA polymerase 1 has to come in and get rid of that primer that was there before and replace it with, D, with DNA nucleotides instead of RNA nucleotides. And then DNA ligase needs to come in and then connect all of these pieces together so that it's one solid continuous chain of DNA. And so all these additional enzymes are necessary, again, because of the anti-parallel structure. If DNA was an anti-parallel, we could replicate both the strands like the leading strand is done, but we would have less stable DNA. So it's kind of like having more st st stable DNA has created a more complicated way of replicating the DNA, but at least, you know, and the stability of DNA is the key here. So let's summarize all of the enzymes that we think we can identify in this diagram. So what you can do is you can pause it and you can just give it a shot. There's some new things on this as well that we're going to introduce, but let's see if you can identify all these things. Okay, you try it. All right, so first off, helicase, right? Remember, helicase is going to break the hydrogen bond so we can unwind our DNA. All right, we've got DNA polymerase, uh, well, that's DNA polymerase 3, right? Adding our um, DNA complementary strand on our leading strand, right? We have 3 prime of our leading strand, and you should be able to identify then for the 5 prime, right? So you should be able to know that if we're moving this direction, you should be able to identify three primes and five primes. So that means that this new strand form, that must be the five prime. So the opposite of the five prime of the new strand must be the three prime. So that means the other end must be the five prime. And so you should be able to identify all of the different parts, all the different five primes and three primes. Okay. You should be able to identify the lagging strand because there are fragments present. Right. Uh, this is a new one. These are single-stranded binding proteins. They're basically magnesium ions, which are positively charged. 
And so they actually help to hold open the DNA after helicase has come through. We don't want the hydrogen bonds to accidentally reform, and then, then it would cause a huge problem because then we need to get helicase to, a new helicase to come in and separate them again. So these single-strand binding proteins kind of help hold apart the DNA as helicase does its job just to make sure that it doesn't actually come back together again before we can finish the other process of DNA replication. Okay, we also have topoisomerase, which don't worry if you think that's a really long name because you can also call it DNA gyrase. And DNA gyrase basically helps to stop the DNA from supercoiling as it starts to separate. So if you think about this, imagine you had you know, so, um, some string, and you know that string is basically just more in, or twine, sorry, is like little bits of string that have been wrapped around each other to make like an even thicker band of string. So if you were to pull two ends apart, right, you would start to separate them, but then as you do that, the ball of string is gonna start to spin, it's gonna start to get all super coiled and condensed, and eventually it could create like a knot that's just not really gonna be able to allow you to continue to separate them because there will be too much surface area rubbing against each other, too much friction, and that kind of causes a problem, right? So that's what would actually happen to DNA as well. As DNA helicase and these proteins are continuing to pull DNA in opposite directions like this, the two strands, these strands that are further down should start to kind of twist together as the result of this action. And then eventually would make a jumbled mess. So DNA gyrase, his job is basically to kind of reverse this. So as DNA starts to wind up, DNA gyrase will actually cut the DNA strand and then spin it in the opposite direction so that it unwinds itself and then heal it again and, and fix the, the place where it cut it. So it's kind of like a, um, an unwinding protein, uh, unwinding enzyme that helps stop the DNA from getting so condensed and coiled as it goes through the process of replication. Okay, so going through this entire process, uh, we just want to summarize again the concept of semi-conservative replication. So if you remember, our base pairing rules. Okay, we know that A's and T's are gonna bind with C's and G's. We know that we're gonna use one half of each of the original DNA strand as a way to form the new strands, right? So that means that one half of the DNA is gonna be used to make the other side or the other parts that's missing. So that means that if we go through the process of DNA replication, it would be considered to be a semi-conservative process because each strand of DNA that is produced is one half original and one half a newly formed complementary strand. And so we've gone through this whole process of DNA replication. Hopefully it's fairly clear uh, exactly um, how this process actually is semi-conservative based on these different enzymes. Okay. So then, now let's give yourself a little bit of a challenge. Can you summarize as much as you can remember uh, what DNA replication is? Just kind of going through the entire process. All right, can you do it? All right, so now let's put out a nice summary for you. So first off, let's start with the DNA replication. DNA replication in general, when's it gonna happen? Happens in S phase, right, of interphase before cell division. It's gonna start with helicase unwinding DNA helix, right, the double helix, breaking the hydrogen bonds of the individual of the two strands so that they can be separated into two parent strands. Single-stranded binding proteins will attach to them to make sure that they stay separated. DNA gyrase will be in front of DNA helicase to help stop strain and twisting of the DNA as this whole process happens. The parent strand is going to be used as a template to basically build a new strand or a complementary strand. This is always going to be done in the 5 to 3 direction, all right, because we have to add nucleotides in the 5 to 3, 5 prime to a 3 prime. And so because of this and DNA being anti-parallel, this creates a continuous or what we call a leading strand and a discontinuous or a lagging strand. So the leading strand would be moving towards the helicase or the same direction as helicase, where the lagging strand would be going in the opposite direction and would be moving away from helicase. All right, and because of that, the lagging strand has what we call Okazaki fragments. All right, so maybe some other things you would have wrote down. So we're gonna have to add primers, right, using RNA primase to our DNA strains, chains so that we can actually have DNA polymerase three add or attach itself to the DNA. Uh, then it will use complementary base pairing rules, adenine binding with thymine, cytosine binding with guanine. The nucleotides are gonna be, uh, in the nucleus, they're gonna have their own energy source with them. So we actually call them DNTPs or deoxynucleoside triphosphates. And so they will release the energy needed to make the, the phosphodiester bonds uh, when they go through this process by having those phosphates being released from them. 
Uh, DNA polymerase 1 is going to be responsible for removing any RNA primers so that we can replace them with DNA, or it does replace them with DNA, but it doesn't make phosphodiester bonds, so DNA ligase is going to have to make those phosphodiester bonds, uh, which will join the sections of the Ozaki fragments together to make one continuous chain. And so since each parent chain was used to, as a guide to make the new complementary chain or to synthesize the new chain, we would say that this whole process is a semi-conservative replication. Right, so that is a ton of information. And hopefully if you study this process and you get good at drawing it out, I really suggest you draw it out in your notes over and over again. Just add the information, add the enzymes, describe what they're all doing in this process. Hopefully you'll just become a master of re explaining DNA replication, so if it comes up on a test, you'll be perfectly fine. This video is just going on super long. I was really hoping to keep it under an hour, so I'll try to go as quick as possible. But basically there's just two things left we want to talk about. So first off, though we copy all of the DNA, right, every nucleotide, every base, in a DNA strain has to be copied when we go through DNA replication. It's interesting that that is done because not all sections of DNA are actually used to create proteins. There are lots of sections of DNA that are just there for regulation or not used at all. And so we're gonna talk more about these types of um, sections of DNA and, and how they are useful. But basically, if we were to map it all out, if we looked at humans, humans, approximately 3.1 billion bases, but if we look at our introns, right, introns are basically sections of DNA that are just there to kind of help protect us from mutations or fill up space between important sections. And so a good percent of our DNA, maybe about, you know, 40% of our DNA is actually not really used for anything. It's just filler DNA that's kind of in the way. So I say introns are in the way, so you can try to remember that. A good proportion of our DNA, right, over 50% of our DNA is used for things, but not really creating proteins. It might be used for some other type of regulatory process, but not specifically making a protein. But actually quite a small percent of our DNA is specifically made for just making polypeptides. All right, well, we would call these our exon sections of our DNA. So when you think about our introns versus our exons, if we were to take a strain of DNA, there would be introns and exons stuck between them. And so the exons, those are the ones that are important. Those are the ones that actually get used to make a protein. Where these introns are not important. They're in the way. We, we don't really use them for anything. So when we go through the process of changing DNA into RNA, into our mature mRNA, we actually will go through the process and we will cut out these introns, and we will get rid of them so that we have just the exons present. So only the exons in DNA are actually useful uh, in terms of actually making a physical product like a protein. And all these extra insons, intron sections, we edit them out, or I say that they're in the way because they're no longer needed and they're not gonna be used to make a protein. So it's interesting that we go through this process to replicate DNA as accurate as possible when a large percent of the DNA that we're replicating is actually not used for anything. So when we start talking about mutations in topic three though, uh, we're gonna come back to this. So we're gonna talk about why introns are actually kind of necessary, okay? So just remember that introns are the ones that are in the way, where exons are the ones that get expressed and the ones that are removed, all right? So the exons are the ones that are expressed and they're not removed, they're kept, sorry. So other things in our DNA are non-coding sections of DNA. They might be involved in the process of um, making proteins, but they don't necessarily make a protein specifically. So for example, there could be sections of the DNA that we just copied that are considered promoter regions. And so there are sections of the DNA right before a, uh, a gene that makes a protein that tells RNA polymerase where it needs to bind to the DNA. So it tells RNA where it needs to start it to start be able to go through the process of transcription. So large sections of the DNA might just be there to help regulate the process of making proteins, but they're not actually physically making proteins. So again, all of these sections are going to be necessary to be replicated. So it's important that we replicate all the sections of the DNA in, uh, accurately so that we don't accidentally have problems with our protein expression. So some of these sections might be considered enhancers, 
right? So they might increase the rate of transcription, or they could be silencers. They could be things that inhibit the rate of transcription. So the regulation of how DNA is actually going to be used to make proteins is in DNA itself as well. So it's not just that DNA has all this information for making the proteins that physically make you, but the regulation for how DNA is actually even going to be used by your cells is actually incorporated into the instruction of DNA's base sequences. So again, going back to this idea that DNA replication, even though there's large sections of DNA that might not necessarily be used to make a protein, most of the DNA is important. All right? And so we do want to make sure that we replicate it quickly and accurately before going through DNA replication. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is our telomeres. And so you see these little green highlighted sections that they put in this, this image. It's a little, little overdone, but yes, um, those are highlighting what we call the telomeres, the very ends of our chromosomes. And it's basically the very ends of our DNA strand. So if you remember, RNA polymerase it can um, make so RNA primers uh, are, are used to, uh, to allow DNA to kind of stick to or DNA polymerase to stick to the DNA so that it can start the process of DNA replication. And there are some instances in the lagging strand where the primer gets removed and DNA polymerase 1 will then come in and add the nucleotides. And then DNA ligase will come in and will fix the backbone between those sections, right? It'll, it'll make sure that they're all connected to each other. So these enzymes work really, really well, except there's only one part in tie and a strain of DNA that these enzymes can't really function very well because there isn't an existing nucleotide for them to bind to, and that is the very ends of the opposite sides of the DNA. And so the very ends of the DNA are actually going to not get replicated every time your, D your DNA goes through replication. And so a little tiny bit of your DNA gets erased every time you go through DNA replication, starting at the very ends of your DNA. So those sections are called telomeres. And normally there are large sections of DNA that are highly repetitive that do not produce anything. They don't make any proteins. They don't do any regulation. They're basically a long intron section. And so these really long intron sections at the very ends of our DNA, of all of our different chromosomes, are there to protect the important parts of the DNA because every time we go through DNA replication, the DNA is going to get shorter and shorter, and eventually that's going to start to affect an important section of the DNA. Now, there's some interesting things about telomeres, though, because as they degrade over time, um, they are possibly the reason why cells become less healthy and why aging occurs. And so there's, there's this kind of theory and there's some investigation going now. Um, it's been going on for several decades about whether or not telomeres disappearing is where aging comes from. So the idea that your, your organs and your body don't really you know, function as well, even though they might replace themselves, right? You can replace sections of your body. Your muscle tissues can make new muscle tissues for your entire life, right? But when you get older, your muscles aren't really as good. Certain parts of your body aren't gonna function as well. Your cells don't really seem to function as well, even though they go through DNA replication and they are technically new cells, right? And that might be because of these telomeres disappearing, the DNA is becoming less and less stable, and so the cells are less stable, and then hence, and, and so that means that aging is occurring. So this might be this natural process built into the structure of DNA so that living things don't live forever, because really in a balanced ecosystem, we don't want things living forever, we want things to eventually die so that their nutrients, their organic compounds can be recycled back into the ecosystem to be allowed to be there for some new living thing to be created. The other thing that's interesting about this is that there is an enzyme that stops this whole process. There's an enzyme that will repair your telomeres. It's called telomerase. And guess what? You actually have the information for telomerase already inside of your body because you had telomerase being very active before you were born. The most amount of DNA replication you ever go through, because you have the most amount of growth that you ever experience, is when you're developing in as a fetus. You're going through crazy amounts of DNA replication over the nine months it took for you to develop so that you could be born. And during those large amounts of replication, we don't want the telomeres disappearing because eventually that means you might be unstable and you won't be born. 
So you have an enzyme that's present in your DNA that tells telomeres or allows telomeres to be fixed, and that is our telomerase enzyme. And for some reason that we don't quite understand yet, this enzyme gets deactivated before you are born. And so basically from the day you are born, you start to age. Your telomeres start to get shorter, which is the process of aging. And so the interesting idea is, if we could turn this enzyme back on, could we stop aging? Would there be a way to repair our telomeres so that we don't actually age once we are get to a certain point, and we would just stay, you know, kind of young and healthy for for you know as long as we want till eventually we've decided you know it's time to die. And so there's research looking into why does telomerase turn off, and is there a way to turn it back on in order to help kind of reverse or stop the process of aging? Okay, so I know this has been incredibly long, and I'm hitting my hour mark, but Go through this, make sure you know this, the, the process of DNA replication. It's probably the most complicated thing that we will ever learn in all of the, the IB, H, uh, IB HL biology content. So really focus on it. And if you have any questions, please let me know.